Hi everyone! Okay, so I thought I would actually give my YouTube channel a little bit of love. So what I've decided to do is take some of my recent work in progress videos of my latest sculpt, Draffy, but re-edit it to make it a little bit longer, because I don't know why, but some of you have actually um, shown some interest in wanting to see a more in-depth video on YouTube specifically. So I'm now doing a commentary over the top and unfortunately you now have me for the next 30 minutes. Sorry! And there's also a bit of a disclaimer as well. I'm very new to casting myself. I've only been casting for about three years, maybe less. And I've only been doing two part moulds like since the beginning of this year. So I know that there are lots and lots of ways to make casts and to uh, mold mold um, sculpts so this is just how i currently do it i hope that it helps someone out there i don't know um, but i always like to share what i know um, and so maybe hopefully someone will pick something up from this but yeah uh, anyway but that's my disclaimer i'm no expert i'm going to be doing a two-part mold today and I tend to make them out of foam board, especially for bigger ones like this. So Draffy is um, just over six inches tall. Silicon can be really heavy, so it has to be strong enough to hold it. But I find that five to ten mil foam board is more than adequate for, for the size that I use. But I know for a fact that people swear by lots of different materials. I know people that use Lego bricks. Um, perspex, um, all sorts of things to to make their box. I just like foam board. So to make the first part of the mold I use sulfur free, and this is very important, sulfur free plasticine. And I tend to use artist grade because it's it, it's reusable. What you should never do is use the cheapest kids plasticine because if it doesn't state it it's very likely to have sulfur in it and this will affect how the um, silicon cures. Basically it won't cure properly and then you will have wasted loads of money and have a lot of stress about it. So always check to make sure that the material does not react with the silicon that you're using. I use NSP clay, so it's a kind of artist grade clay and it's, it's really fantastic. Uh, I couldn't find any in Singapore, I had to import it. So if anyone knows anywhere that I can buy it in Singapore, please do tell me. Um, but if not, yes, I had to, I imported uh, two blocks and it's lasted me loads because I can just reuse it. So that's plenty for me for now. Some people actually even use it to do their master sculpt, but for me, I, I, I can't sculpt with it very easily. So this is about as much as I can do with it. It's very important in two-part moulds um, to make sure that the clay is as clean to the edge of the sculpt as possible. This is the most important area of the mould. So I spend quite a lot of time um, making it as smooth and as close as possible. Um, it's very important to try and get the centre of the mold. So I tend to draw a line down it to get the center. The only place that I don't do a center is uh, here you can see the four legs because I'm so stubborn and I keep having to cast like really difficult shapes like four legs. I mean I sometimes dream of the day where I can do um, a cast for uh, two legs or like an open bottom mold but yeah no it's it, it's never to be it's always for so this is why i have to put this dip in the reason that i work um on it outside of the box is because once you put it in it's really hard to access that little leg area it's also imperative to plan your vents as well i know for a fact that just because i have a pressure pot it doesn't mean it would mitigate the air pocket that would be under the chin so I put the little wire there as a placeholder um, for the vent and to be honest with you it's more visual. You don't actually need to put a wire in. You could actually just cut it into the silicon after you've moulded both sides. But I just do it so I can see where I need to put the keys. 
So once I put it in the box, it's just a case of building it up during the sides and cleaning it all up. It's quite it's quite boring work, and but I only use my finger to smooth it down. I know that there are other methods that other people use to make it very very smooth, but I just use my finger and some tools. It's pretty messy stuff, so I tend to wear gloves. Um, I've tried it with my finger once and I just couldn't get it off, it was awful. Because um, it's oil based, so I try um, always to do it with gloves now. The reason that it I find that getting it smooth is good is because if you don't make the surface smooth, sometimes the silicon can get into the little crevices and then it kind of makes a mess and it, all the clay gets trapped in your... Um, in your silicon mold. So I just work on it for a really long time as much as possible and as you can see I'm getting super frustrated with that little leg bit, it's really really hard to work on it. <laughs> I also try to put a little bit of clay up into the corners, you'll see that in a minute, um, because if you haven't done your box with enough glue it can sometimes leak. This is also why it's imperative that you put it in like a tub. I have once had it where it started leaking a little bit. I thankfully saved it and managed to plug it up with some uh, plasticine. So yes, the it, the cast was saved. So yeah, I put it up, up, up into the corner right there. It might be a little bit overkill. Uh, I think it's just paranoia maybe that I do that, but it's habit now, I just I just do that. So now we're getting to one of my favourite parts of making the mould, and that's adding the keys. So the keys act as like fingers to interlock together when, when the two parts are put together. So I like to put two big um, keys in the corner, well, sorry, four big keys in the corner, and, and I like to put keys in different directions. So um, the ones around the outside, the small ones, I tend to use a tool to push down into it and then the ones on the outside I tend to use these kind of like uh, hex nut kind of acorn cap things. I don't. Everyone calls them something different but I tend to just put as many as I can on the outside. It's a little bit overkill, you probably don't need to put this many and you also don't need to use this kind of um, cap. You can use lots of things to make keys, it's just as long as there's like a parts sticking up and uh, that just help interlock the, the the mold. With this particular silicon they suggest half an inch around all sides so yeah I'm just marking it out now. I use two-part silicon it's Mold Star 30 by Smooth On. Uh, you just have to be really careful and mix it up as much as possible scrape the sides. Even though they say you don't have to degas it, I like to degas it. What it does is it makes the bubbles big and it rises until it collapses like this, so that means um, a lot of the bubbles have, have gone. Uh, and I really like doing degassing for, um, for mold making because it really, really helps. So you're supposed to pour it slowly in a long line, but I'm not going to lie to you. I poured this one really, really badly because the camera got in the way and I panicked and, and, and poured it a little bit too fast. What it really should happen is it should um, s slowly drain in and spread very nicely and evenly. But unfortunately, this one spread a little bit too far. And you should also try and pour it as far away from the sculpt itself, so try not to pour directly onto the sculpt if you can help it. So bubbles are the thing that everyone is trying to mitigate in the casting process. This is a real-time one, so you can see that by doing it in a long line, um, it really helps pop some of those bubbles. So it's not perfect, but for example, if you don't have a vacuum chamber, this is a very good technique to, to utilize so that you can at least help the process along. <laughs> but yes, actually it's very slow. It's like, uh, like in the videos, it's all sped up and it looks really fast, but actually it's quite, quite slow process. Thankfully, it has quite a long working life.
you have to be really careful when you take that clay off because you don't want to like accidentally pull the sculpt away from the first half of the silicon so yeah be really really careful when you take it off Moldstar 30 apparently only takes about six hours but uh, I usually end up leaving overnight so it's usually about 12 hours before I actually um, handle the silicon it's quite laborious again doing this it just trying to get those little bits of clay that are stuck um, I've seen videos where they say oh yeah just use a stiff brush but really that doesn't work for me just just elbow greasing it and slowly working it out is the only way that I've managed to to do it and you can see that edge you have to be really careful because you actually don't want to disrupt that edge too much if you disrupt it it could cause problems when you're casting it so try and do it as carefully as possible I try and to get the most out with the tool but then I sometimes have to use um, like a, what do you call it like um like a very very small swab to, to get out the real problem areas but yeah so I just slowly work around getting it out and then it's quite hard to get those little nut things out with your hands so I just use some pliers but if you don't press them in enough they do leave a little bit of a uh, what do you call it S silicon part into it so I have to often cut those off because I've not always pressed them incorrectly and silicon really gets into those gaps so it's very wise to cut them off otherwise it might affect the key when it's being cast from the, the second part so yeah I just continue all the way around cleaning very very boring <laughs> Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm so sad that you guys actually really wanted to watch this <laughs> because like it's so boring to watch. When even when I'm doing it, sometimes I just think, oh no, no, why, why am I doing this? Everything you can do well in the master sculpt and the first mold, the better all the casts are going to be after that. So uh, I'm just pushing back the little vent in to because it kind of came out in the clay. When I do the second box, I actually glue it in place with the first part of the mold inside so it has the closest seal as possible. But I have to be very, very careful not to squoosh it too much because you don't want to like deform the mold when you're making the new mold box around it. And as you can see, probably far too much glue. And there we go. That was actually a bit of a better pour this time. You could see that it actually spread out a little bit more evenly. Yeah, so again, three batches. I always find that you need a lot more silicon than you think you do. Like when I first was learning, I bought some silicon and then I would constantly have to rush back to the shop because I wouldn't have bought enough and I needed to buy some before it would cure. <laughs> so like, yeah. I didn't put it in the video but before I poured the second half I put a lot of mold release on because if you don't put mold release on it will actually fuse together and you won't be able to pull it apart so here's the moment of truth and there we go I knew going into this that in my experience because I like to use polymer clay as my master sculpts I do find that it's not strong enough to withhold when I actually take them out of the mold sometimes so unfortunately both the antlers broke off and the two legs broke off so I can fix it if I really really wanted to but what I tend to do is just use a master um, of one of the casts that I do so I just save one of the the new casts that I make from these um, yeah and getting it out was so not fun because I was like oh how am I going to get this piece out and uh, hand drill was, was the winner in this case. Now that I've finally got the master sculpt out, I just need to clear off a little bit of the, uh, the clay inside. And um, the vents also need to connect because it didn't quite touch. Normally I would actually sculpt in the 
sprues and the pouring holes basically you can often sculpt them in using some of the plasticine clay or you can specifically sculpt it into the master if you want but in this case i just wanted to cut them in in my experience doing these four legged casts i find it really difficult to actually get it in into the box when i'm making it so i have to cut away anyway so i just thought i'd do it This is actually my first multi-part sculpt. So I'm now doing a one-part cast for the antler balls. So this is one example. So I'm just using the clay to actually make the pore spout. Because these are really small, you don't actually need to have very strong walls like you do for bigger casts. So this is just like an old kitchen roll and that's like perfectly acceptable for this. Uh, some people use like plastic cups sometimes as well. The great thing about one part moulds is they are much quicker to make. You don't have to fuss with all the clay and stuff like that. Um, the only thing is, is that you then have to cut it to get it out often. Because it also doesn't have keys, you have to cut it in this kind of like zigzaggy way to try and give it keys artificially, essentially. Um, but no matter how I, hard I try, I always end up cutting the master sculpt inside. You can see that I've cut it. And, um, you know, a, a lot of people online say, oh, yeah, just be careful when you cut it. And it's like no matter how much I try, because it's so fidgety, it's difficult. So now I'm preparing the mould for, for resin casting, but out of camera I use released agent and this is um, just a talcum powder, corn starch version. So it's probably a bit overkill to use both, but it basically helps the life of your mould. So I kind of try to get about 40 pulls from one one, but I can sometimes get more if I'm careful and respect my mold. <laughs> uh, I love using rubber bands and they also aren't affected by putting them in the pressure pot. In this case, I didn't cut it all the way down, so um, I only need to put rubber bands on the top of these ones. Uh, but these ones are a little bit more difficult to put the release agent in. So now we come to resin casting. I personally like to weigh mine. I know a lot of people swear by the volume, so a lot of people, a lot of resin is like one to one volume, so they'll just mark the same level on two cups and then pour into a third cup. But I like to be quite accurate. So um, with the resin that I'm using, which is Smooth On, I think Smooth Cast 305, has a pot life of seven minutes and a cure time of 30. Um, as soon as I put part A and B together, I start the timer, even though I'm still mixing it because it's still taking effect. Now, seven minutes is actually not very long, and I really respect anyone who does it in the three minutes with the with the quicker cure one. But I'm always going to get air bubbles, even no matter how good I mix. So I do like to pop it into the vacuum chamber, but I'm very careful with the fast cast ones because um, it can get a little bit splash inside if you let the air back in too quickly with these ones. So yeah, just, just pouring it into the mould. This is the very, very first pour that I did and I was so nervous because this was my first uh, first cast of this and I knew I was being filmed. So yeah, like I, I poured it out a little bit too much. So I'm putting it in the pressure pot. What the pressure pot does is it doesn't actually affect the cure time at all. All it's doing is crushing those micro bubbles. So you know when I mixed it, you could see the, the little bubbles got in. This just is literally crushing those bubbles, but you have to leave it in to cure the whole time. Otherwise, the bubbles just come back if you leave the... So once it's cured, it'll be okay. 
On a serious note though, if you do invest in a pressure pot, remember they're a no joke piece of equipment. Always practice safety. I quite like having a pressure pot. It really helps with the fast cure ones, but you don't need to have a pressure pot or a vacuum chamber, to be honest with you, especially when you're learning. I'd only got one this year. I actually spent two years without a pressure pot and I used a slightly longer, a longer cure resin because uh, it helps the air bubbles come up a bit more and I could use the vacuum chamber only. So yeah, for most of the time, I actually only had a vacuum chamber for, for, for most of my toy career so far. <laughs> and moment of truth. Oh, I get nervous around this, doing this, and uh, it it might look like it's really simple to pull apart, but it's actually quite a lot of force here, and I know that the leg shape is very awkward. So, woohoo! Got it out! And I remember thinking, oh wow, this is actually a lot better than I thought. I thought it was going to look awful <laughs> when I pulled it out. I thought there'd be air bubbles everywhere, air pockets everywhere, but I'm actually really happy with how it came out. As, uh, especially as I've I've not been casting that long myself. But yes, I did put those sprues in the wrong place, I think, and uh, I had to cut it to get it out. So as you can see, it's really awkward for me to pull out and I have to do this every time I cast from this mold. Uh, this is how you learn to do casting. You learn the hard way. So hard lessons all around. <laughs> but there you go. Um, it's It's out now. You can see the, the vent works and you, you can see that there's some flashing. So what I need to do now is just clean up the cast. I quite like cutting off vents and stuff like that when I've pulled it because it's a tiny little bit softer. Because uh, when it's fully cured after I think like, is it 12 hours or 24 hours or something like that? Um, it's much, much harder to cut. Once it has fully, fully cured, I then go and sand it. This is literally the bane of my existence. And nearly every toy person I've ever talked to absolutely loathes sanding as well. So I don't think I'm alone with this one. It's pretty much unavoidable. Even though I what I made what I consider quite a tight mold, um, it's still gonna leave a seam line. So um, sometimes you might see plastic items made from factories and you'll probably see a seam line. As an artist I actually like to sand these off because it looks more professional if you sand them off. It just takes so much time. I usually start with a 180 grit so quite a, quite a rough wet and dry. I also like to use wet and dry because I'm not really set up for any kind of power tools in my house so uh, wet and dry is like the best option for me. For really really stubborn parts I use that that red tool and it's basically like a toothbrush that has wet and dry paper on the end. Um, it's really fantastic. I think it's a Mr. Hobby tool, um, like a polishing tool, but it can be used wet as well which is quite rare. It's a little bit awkward to use sometimes because if you press it too hard you, you can sand a little bit too much off. So sometimes I actually prefer hand sanding. Despite all my sanding and how well I thought that it went, there were still a few air bubbles and I think that the best way to deal with those is to actually drill them out and then fill them in with resin putty. So here I'm using Magisculpt but I sometimes also use Epoxy Sculpt I think it's called um, as another option and yeah I just smoosh it into the holes as much as possible, smooth it out with water and my finger. It does mean that I tend to have to go back and um, you know, re-sand those little areas that I filled in, but it's okay, it doesn't take as long the second time. But yes, it does cause more times and I really wish I was better at sculpting. <laughs> I really wish my, my sculpts were completely bubble free, but I've not quite got to that, that stage yet. But 
Also, it takes a few casts for you to know where the where the air pockets and the air bubbles tend to be. So, um, for example, under the chin, I improved. So now I've got to the painting stage. I love the painting stage. In some ways, if I could get rid of all the other stages and only paint, that would be great. But there is also something still magical about making something 3D, making your idea 3D and having it and holding it in your hands. So off camera, I primed this first because plastic uh, acrylic is what most people use to paint the details, but it doesn't adhere to plastic very well. So you need a primer to kind of help the, the adhesion of the paint above it. I tend to draw on, I'm not one of these magical people that can just like by eyesight go, yes, I'm definitely got that symmetrical. <laughs> I definitely can't do that. I actually also um, pretty goth uh, in my in my youth, so I do sometimes have like moments where I have to do something really goth and like er dark. So this is a full on grayscale um, paint job this time. Yeah. Now I'm quite like detail orientated work, so um, it was quite it was quite interesting to do such big flat areas. I really pride myself on flat areas. It, you, the, the best way to do it is to try and get the paint so it's not too thick but not too runny and then get a really flat soft brush and then just like go over it and try and work the paint to make sure it doesn't leave streaks. Um, it can be difficult uh, and I find it really difficult, even more difficult on 3D objects uh, compared to doing illustration on 2D. But yeah, I, I, I really enjoy um, the painting process. There's no, I don't know if there's that much I can really comment on it. I, I have to admit though that when I drew these skulls on paper, it looks, it looks easier. But when, I was, when it was in 3D, I realized that the shape of the skull couldn't quite be what I was hoping. So I got it as close as I could, but yeah, it's, it's okay. <laughs> I think that's the beauty of, of um, art. It can change depending on what you're doing and what you can actually achieve. So after a day, um, I go back and I just erase the pencil marks that I did. Uh, I felt like it was missing something on the skull. So I was adding in some more depth a bit more detail and the magic thing that I realized it was missing was just some just some simple lines so yeah I just I just those simple lines gave it some definition and some more interest and from different angles so yeah I was really happy with that I'm just putting in a little bit more uh, detail on the legs and just putting another coat on thankfully it covered quite well the coverage of it is quite well sometimes I have to do flats maybe three or four times. I don't know why, I was an idiot. I decided that I was gonna do fishnets all the way around it. And I realized that this was really, really difficult. So I did a lot of it off camera um, because I really needed to focus and concentrate on it. So in the end, it turned out all right. As a kind of bonus afterthought, I really wanted to make this pewter charm. It's actually cast using the mold as well. It's basically the same technique and thankfully pewter has a very very low melt point. So I made some necklaces and I also recycled a, a bracelet. And there it is, it's draffy. Uh, from casting to painting, I'm really happy with how it turned out. And if you've made it this far, thank you so much. I really hope that you've enjoyed it and maybe got some tips from it. Okay, thanks so much. Bye.